1862, St. John Bosco spoke to the boys and young priests that he was training about a dream he had dreamt a few nights before. Some of you may be familiar with this dream. It's well known. I ask you this morning to listen carefully because I specifically want you to think of the big ship in his dream as your soul and you as the supreme commander. In St. John Bosco's dream, the Pope is the supreme commander of the ship, which represents the Catholic Church. But as you hear once again this dream, again, think of yourself. You're the supreme commander, your soul. You are the one who has supreme responsibility for your soul. And your soul is out on the stormy waters. So, quoting Don Bosco, I want to tell you a dream. I had the dream some days ago. There is a vast sheet of water and a fleet of countless ships arranged ready for battle. The prows of the ship are formed into sharp spear-like points so that wherever they are thrust, they pierce and completely destroy. These ships are armed with cannons, with lots of rifles, with incendiary materials, with other arms of all kinds, and also with books. And they advance against a ship very much bigger and higher than themselves and try to ram into it with their prows or to burn it or in some way to do it every possible harm. As escorts to that majestic, fully equipped ship, there are many smaller ships which receive commands by signals from it and carry out movements to defend themselves from the opposing enemy fleet. In the midst of the immense expanse of sea, two mighty columns of great height arise a little distance, the one from the other. On the top of one, there is the statue of the Immaculate Virgin, from whose feet hangs a large placard with this inscription, Auxilium Christianorum, Help of Christians. On the other, which is much higher and bigger, stands a host of great size, proportionate to the column. And beneath is another placard with the words, Salus Credentium, Salvation of the Faithful. The supreme commander on the big ship is the sovereign pontiff, the Pope. He, on seeing the fury of the enemies and the evils among which his faithful find themselves, decided to call around himself the captains of the smaller ships to hold a meeting and decide on what is to be done. All the captains come aboard and gather around the Pope. They hold a meeting. But meanwhile, the wind and the waves gather into a great storm, so they are sent back to control their own ships. There comes a short lull, a period of calm. For a second time, the Pope gathers the captains around together around him while the flagship sails on its course. But the frightful storm returns. The Pope stands at the helm and all his energies are directed to steering the ship towards those two columns, from the top of which and from every side of which are hanging numerous anchors and big hooks fastened to chains. All the enemy ships move to attack it, and they try in every way to stop it and to sink it, some with writings or books or inflammable materials, of which they are full, others with guns, with rifles, and with rams. The battle rages ever more relentlessly. The enemy prows thrust violently, but their efforts and the impact of the prows prove useless. They make attempts in vain and waste all their labor and ammunition. The big ship sails safely and smoothly on its way. Sometimes it happens that struck by formidable blows from the prows or cannonball of enemy ships, the flagship of the church gets large deep holes in its sides. 
But no sooner is the harm done than a gentle breeze blows from the two columns and the cracks close up and the holes are repaired immediately. Meanwhile, the guns of the attackers are blown up, the rifles and other arms and prows are broken. Many ships are shattered and sink into the sea. Then the raging enemies strive to fight hand to hand with fists, with blows, with blasphemy and with curses. All at once the Pope falls gravely wounded. Immediately those who are with him run to help him and they lift him up. A second time the Pope is struck, he falls again and dies. A shout of victory and of joy rings out amongst the enemies and from their ships an unspeakable mockery arises. But hardly is the Pope dead than another Pope takes his place. The captains of the smaller ships of the church having met together have elected the Pope so quickly that the news of the death of the Pope comes together with the news of the election of the successor. The enemies begin to lose courage. The new Pope, putting the enemy to rout and overcoming every obstacle, guides the ship right up to the two columns and comes to rest between them. Then with a light chain that hangs from the bow, he chains the ship to an anchor on the column on which stands the host. And with another light chain which hangs from the stern, it's the back, of the, the back end of the ship, he fastens it to another anchor hanging from the column on which stands the Immaculate Virgin. Then a great surprise takes place. Whirlpools appear in the sea. All the ships that until then had fought against the Pope's ship are scattered as they tried to flee away, but they collide and break to pieces one against another. Some sink and try to sink others. Several small ships which had fought bravely for the Pope raced to be the first to chain themselves to those two columns. Many other ships, having retreated through fear of the battle, cautiously watch from far away. The wrecks of the broken ships having been scattered in the whirlpools of the sea, they in turn sail in good earnest to those two columns. And having reached them, they chained themselves fast to the hooks hanging down from them, and there they remain safe together with the principal ship on which is the Pope. Over the sea there reigns a great calm. Don Bosco described this dream many times to his students, and in a letter dated February the 13th, 1863, he wrote to Pope Pius IX about the dream. Obviously, the dream has primarily to do with the great battle of the Catholic Church with the forces of the world and the forces of evil and really even has a lot to do specifically with our times given the crisis in the church that we are facing. Most definitely the seas are very stormy and there are many, many enemy, sh enemy ships arrayed against the Catholic Church in our own times. But specifically for the purpose of this morning's talk, I want you to also remember this dream of John Bosco and apply it to your own soul. Because all of us are necessarily out on the sea, the sea representing the world. We live in the world. And we're living in a world that is doing many, in, in many different ways, and that's where we have the, the richness of the symbols in Don Bosco's dreams of all these different weapons, you know, guns, rifles, cannonballs, the ships ramming, the, even, the, even books, um, uh, we can say evil books, um, impure books. So many ways that the storms of the sea and the storms of the world are attacking our souls. And... It's so important that we take this seriously and that we believe uh, the, the battle 
that is raging for our individual souls. Um, if our souls are out on the sea, well, there are definitely many storms. And we can say that these storms are all the false attractions of the world. Mm -hmm.